video, I want to talk about how to answer questions on oscillation and simple harmonic motion in A-levels. And it's a very daunting topic to start answering questions about because there are very many equations and formulas and there's just a lot of substance in that chapter. So hopefully by doing past papers, it really streamlines the amount of information that you should be learning. So we're going to work through a bunch of different questions from various papers, all pretty recent, to look at what they're actually going to ask of you. So let's start with this one. This one is in the Majin paper in 2022. It's paper 4.1. And I think it's a very typical example of what a simple harmonic motion or an oscillation question looks like. So over here, it says that a pendulum consists of a bob, which is a small metal sphere attached to the piece, the end of a piece of a string, and then the other end is connected to a fixed spot, and the bob oscillates with small oscillations about its equilibrium position. So this is exactly what they're telling us, and it's fixed over here, and it's essentially just telling us it's going to oscillate over here. What we should be paying attention to is the length, so L of the string is given over here and we know that equilibrium is over here maximum displacement is given by x so you should all note that and then they say that the length of the pendulum measured from the fixed point to the center of the bob is 1.24 meters and the acceleration a of the bob varies with its displacement x from the equilibrium position as shown in figure 8.2 so we see that the acceleration to the distance the maximum displacement is constant for one because it has a straight line so this is a linear graph and it's also it has a negative gradient so this is really important and it comes up over and over again because in the very next question they're going to ask you state how figure point 4.2 shows that the motion of the pendulum is simple harmonic and we know that a simple harmonic motion has an acceleration that is directly proportional to the uh, displacement of the object from the equilibrium position and we also know that the force the restoring force that pushes the object back into this equilibrium position it gets bigger the bigger the x becomes so we know that these two are the prerequisites of simple harmonic motion and so we all we need to do is just use certain keywords to analyze the graph and that would be this So the negative gradient shows that the displacement is in the opposite direction to the acceleration and this is very self-explanatory because we know that the positive of something would have the negative of the other things. So to really exemplify what I mean by that, if we have a positive of x, we would have a negative of a, which means that they are always going to be in opposite directions to each other. So that's the first part. And this is the second part. The straight line shows that the acceleration is directly proportional to the displacement. So previously I talked about how the straight line means that the curve, the graph is linear. So if there is a linear relationship, then there is a direct proportionality between the two constants. So the higher something is, the higher the other whatever is. So that is what you should be commenting on, these two things. They're really straightforward, and this is a question that comes up super often, so I would really recommend just knowing this by heart to save time. Now we have to get into some math. So they tell us to use figure 4.2 to determine the angular frequency, which is given by omega, of the oscillation. So over here, you have to memorize a formula for a simple harmonic motion. And that formula is A equals negative omega square. And if you want to derive this, do check out this one video where I talk about all of the equations of oscillation, simple harmonic motion, and how to derive them. And it is actually also given to you over here. So you have this equation given to you, which is very nice, and it's also worth taking a look at what is given to you in terms of simple harmonic motion. These very like primary equations are given to you, so you wouldn't have to waste a lot of time trying to memorize all of them. But we have this very simple equation that you can get from the beginning of the paper, and all we have to do now is to basically just substitute. So I can do that here. I can, first of all, rearrange this. So the answer is 2.83, so it is 
2.83 radians per second. So it would spin by this much. That would be the angular frequency. So now we've done that, we can go on to this part. So they tell us that the angular frequency, omega, is related to the length L of the pendulum by this equation, where k is a constant. And they tell us to use your answer in B1 to determine k and give a unit with your answer. So we want to be very particular with the units as well. So it's it makes a lot of sense to write down everything that we're doing. So we know that 2.83 radians per second equals to k over the length, which is, you know, we know that L is 1.24 from the data given to us beforehand, so 1.24 meters. So before we get any further on with this, it's time to think about the radian. What does a radian actually mean? The radian is a ratio between, so if you had a sector of a circle, it's the ratio between this and the radius. And this has a unit of meters, this also has a unit of meters. So it's a ratio of these two, which means that there are no units because the meters would cancel out. So you can also just say that if you purely want to talk about the units, it's 2.83 second to the power of negative one. So getting the value in and of itself is not hard. What is tricky is remembering that radians don't actually have units. They're purely ratio. And so this would be the ultimate unit that you get. So I'd write down here 9.7 meters per second squared. Now we have the final part of this question. So while the pendulum is oscillating, the length of the string is increased in such a way that the total energy of the oscillations remains contact. So Justin explained the qualitative effect of this change on the amplitude of the oscillations. So what is the key word here is that the total energy of the oscillations remains contact. I want you to imagine an oscillating pendulum that's going back and forth. If this is lengthened, like this, at the end of the day, the pendulum and the bob will have to be moving much greater distances. So if it continues to do so at the same speed, the angular frequency, which is the frequency of how much it is displaced angularly, this would decrease if this were to stay rather similar. So we know that there will be a decreased omega. A decreased angular frequency. Now we want to make sure that the um, energy remains the same and the way that this would happen is if the amplitude increased. So if the omega decreases um, and the amplitude stays the same, this means that the longer pendulum is simply going to oscillate in the same maximum displacement back and fro. But that's not really what happens. It's more likely to extend all the way here and move here to here. So this is why in order to make sure that the energy stays the same, we need to decrease the angular frequency to offset that energy change and increase that amplitude because we can see that the um, x is going to become, the maximum displacement is going to become even bigger than it was before. So here is the answer. So this is my answer here. So we can just rub this off and this is essentially what will be happening if you pictured the pendulum and what would happen. Um, purely in intuitively we know that if the maximum displacement was this and you lengthen the pendulum, it's not going to start oscillating towards this much, it's going to start oscillating like this. So it's going to be slower in terms of angular frequency in order to increase that amount of amplitude. I hope that makes sense. So this is like the first example we have of a question. It's really typical. The really the only equation that we had to use was this equation and this equation is very common. It comes up all the time and you can easily find it in the front of the paper. A big part of the oscillations chapter is not simple harmonics but resonance and this is a question regarding resonance. So it's very likely that there will be one question in your paper that 
is going to be about oscillations and it's going to be either on simple harmonic motion or on resonance or it's going to be on both of them and somehow they're going to have like one part you know regarding simple harmonic motion and then the latter part regarding the resonance or whatever so this question is mainly about resonance so we can take a look at um how to answer this question so first of all it's really simple and easy they ask us state what is meant by the resonance and we know what is resonance imagine something here it's already moving by itself and then we put a hand here at the same frequency of its movement and we add up add on to it and the amplitude will increase a lot so how you would write this is So that's the definition. You basically have the object being at a maximum amplitude when the driving frequency equals the natural frequency of the object. The keywords that you should look out for here is you should always remember to talk about the maximum amplitude. And then you should also include the world driving frequency and the natural frequency. So those are the keywords that you have to include in, in the definition here. So let's continue onwards. So it says that the figure 4.1 shows a heavy pendulum and a light pendulum, and they're both suspended from the same piece of the string. And this string is secured at each end and fixed to points. So we have this sort of like complex system where there are two pendulums. So there's one heavy one and a light one. Now they have the same natural frequency. The heavy pendulum is set to oscillating perpendicular to the plane of the diagram, which means it's going to come out and go back in. Um, because the plane of the diagram is what we're seeing right now on the paper or on the screen. So this is essentially the variation that the graph shows us of time t of the displacements of the two pendulums for three oscillations. So we have the heavy pendulum. It's oscillating like this. So there are three oscillations. And then we have the light pendulum. It's oscillating like this. And there are three oscillations. So it looks, you know, like they're you know, not in phase, but they actually have the same frequency because of the fact that they exactly contain three oscillations. So that's the first thing that we should realize here. And we also see that the heavy pendulum is moving with a much higher oscillation amplitude than the light one. But other than the amplitudes, they uh, basically have the same frequency. So now the question finally tells us the variation with t of the displacement x of the light pendulum is given by this, which is in centimeters and t is in seconds. So they ask us to calculate the period t of the oscillation. So this is essentially what uh, the equation is kind of derived out of. So the velocity of particle in simple harmonic motion, and we have the variation with t of the displacement of x in the light pendulum, which means that essentially the only thing that we should care about is the omega here. This is telling us that 5.0 pi equals the omega. So omega equals 5.0 pi. And we know that the angular frequency is actually the amount um, of time that it takes for one full oscillation. So it's basically telling us the amount of the angle value in pi um, that is basically moved through per unit time. So that's actually 2 pi over period t because whatever t is, it's going to move through 2 pi in that time. It's going to do a full oscillation during that time. So we just have to do some substitution and that's all we need. So we know that 2 pi over t equals 5.0 pi so we know that t equals 2 pi over 5.0 pi which gives us 0 0.4 seconds so that's our answer right here and now they tell us to label both of the axes with the correct scales and use the space below for any additional working so now that we know the the time this becomes quite easy to do this. So we know that it makes one oscillation in 0.4 seconds. So this is just very easy for us, 0.4. This is another oscillation, that's 0.8. And then that would be 1.2. And you know, you can also fill in the gaps in between 0 0.2, 0.6, 1.0, stuff like that. Now we should talk about the amplitude. So if you go back here, 
we see this right here. This is basically showing us the maximum displacement of the um, particle x. Because when, for instance, there is maximum um, amplitude, and when there is maximum displacement, that means that the sine over here is going to be at a maximum value, and it's going to equal 1, right? So that means maximum displacement has to be, at this time, 0 0.25. That's the highest it's going to get. So we know that that is the case for the light pendulum. So this is 0 0.25, and that makes life a lot easier for us. This is 0 0.5. 0 0.75 and 1 and then you can also put in the negative value if you want to and so that's how you would fill in everything it's pretty straightforward if you wanted to you could also make it as detailed as possible just in case there are marks given for adding extra values whenever you can so I would also suggest just if you have enough time filling out all of the values in detail and now we have the final one. The final question asks us to determine the magnitude of the phase difference between the oscillations of the light and heavy pendulums. And we have to give a unit with our answer. So the phase difference is quite easy to find. We know that over here, we can take a close look at this. And we know that this guy goes back up and hits the x-axis at 0 0.4 but this guy goes back up and hits the x-axis at 0 0.3 so the ultimate time difference that we have here is 0 0.1 seconds and we know that the t uh, the periods of both of these oscillations are the same the periods are both 0 0.4 so if you want to find the phase difference all you have to do is to find the fraction of the difference of time as a fraction of the total period. So what I mean by that is you should just write 0 0.1 out of 0 0.4 and you times this fraction by 2 pi. And this, if you do that, you're going to get half pi radians. And that is the answer. So that's a look at how to calculate these resonance questions. What's really important here in the oscillations chapter is to be able to just use the equations that are given to you in the beginning of the paper very well. So this is the velocity of a particle of simple harmonic motion, but we didn't use it as velocity, we actually used it for displacement. So x equals x o sine omega t, and it's in the same format. And if you want to find the acceleration, you would also find that it's in the same format. Um, we have used this one for simple harmonic motion, and we can use this if the situation arises for it as well. It's good to be able to tie in various formulas that are often used to these things, and you would find that most of the formulas that are required of you, you can actually kind of derive from what you have over here instead of having to memorize everything. And obviously, there are really important, very common questions that occur in these chapters, such as define what resonance is and what is simple harmonic motion. What are the two things that are required for that motion? So these are kind of the skeleton of um, what really constitutes a question in oscillation resonance. I think they're very typical examples of what you might get. And it's a good idea to practice things like this. And hopefully be able to memorize how to answer a lot of the wordy parts. So yeah, so I do hope that this video kind of gave you a good idea of how to go about in these structured questions about oscillations. And I hope it was helpful. Well, ultimately, if you want more videos such as this on physics and A-levels, then do check out the other videos I have on my channel. Uh, thank you so much for watching.